Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the 100% Wild Podcast. I'm Mark Kenyon with Wired to Hunt. With me, as always, is Matt Drury. How are you, man? I'm good, buddy. How are you? I'm not doing too bad at all. I'm back home after a lot of travel, so it's nice to be back in the home office and getting things around here and excited to start the late season hunting in Michigan. Um, so, so those things are all good, but I, I do not... I do not think I'm doing as well as you, Matt, because uh, <laughs> well, you've been on a tear lately. I've I've been very fortunate. I've been lucky, I guess, because you know what really happened? I stopped hunting the lease, and I went to <laughs> places where there were actually deer to shoot. So, <laughs> well, can't, can't kill them if they're not there. It's been it's just been rough, and I got news that during the Missouri rifle season, the the final weekend of the Missouri rifle season uh, on Sunday, that a neighbor – to the north of me that owns about 15 acres of timber he shot uh, and killed ph uh, i got yeah. some pictures of him and you know congratulations to him but that that kind of stopped my i don't have anything else worth hunting there and uh, we you know we went and checked cameras and there's just like every year after gun season there's been no activity no other bucks because i'd be happy to shoot uh, a mature coal buck you know and and try to take care of some of the herd management problems I have, but like the bucks just disappear after gun season and they always have. So, um, I kind of started to alter my plan after that. So pH was shot on Sunday. I think it was like the 17th or some, somewhere in there. And, uh, I was talking with dad and he was on his way to recovering or getting to where he could, where he felt like he could get back into the, the woods. And, you know, at this point we hadn't talked about it publicly about his tree stand accident, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, privately we were kind of hatching our plan as to what we were going to do to get him back in the, into the, um, in the woods. So he was going to go up on Monday, you know, the Missouri season ends Tuesday, you know, Tuesday evening or afternoon or whatever. Um, and so what we did was he went up Monday, or I think he went up Sunday. He hunted Monday afternoon. He got close to the deer that he's been after. He saw him. He just didn't step out into the, you know, out of the woods like all the other deer did, and he didn't get a shot. And um, and then wind was wrong for him to go back into that same spot. So um, he and I both hunted Tuesday. The, I, I went up Monday evening. No, I went up Tuesday morning. And the plan was, all right, one last final sh- try. Let's get it done with a gun. You know, both of us out there with guns in hand. And, um, you know, part of this, what people probably don't realize is, like, our strategy to try to fulfill our show as well, 13. Um, you know, Mark, Taylor, Wade, uh, Dad, and myself, Gary Lavox, Jim Tomey, and Gary and Jim are kind of quote unquote bit players. Like when we get a kill from them, it goes into the show, but we really don't usually get much else as far as like encounters and stuff like that. So yeah. Mark and dad's footage, well, Mark Taylor Wade and dad's footage makes up the majority of the show because they're having such good encounters. Even if they're not killing something, they're having the good encounters with big deer. My, my encounters from the lease never make the cut because they're just not, it, you know, it's just part of it. We're trying to make the best TV. It's just not the best TV. They're not big deer. They're, it's just cutting room floor stuff. Yeah. And so dad and I felt like we were putting too much pressure on Taylor and Wade and Mark, you know, they're trying to, um, you know, you only get so many tags. So, you know, they have tags in Texas, Missouri, Iowa, and between the three of them, they're trying to spread out like, you know, we got to get through each phase and have at least one kill per phase because each phase is an episode. And so it just, you know, we felt the pressure to, I feel it all the time, frankly, because I, I feel like I'm never pulling my load as far as the show goes because I just at the least I'm not having this type of success that our show would require you know and um, so the plan was all right we need to get back out there while we still have guns in hand and we can reach out and touch one and try to you know pull our weight here in the show and it you know I'm, I'm giving you kind of some inside baseball talk because you know it is still very much about the hunt. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're there for a reason. We enjoy it. We love it, but it's also a business to us and we have to, you know, we, we have 
contracts with Outdoor Channel. We got contracts with 30, you know, some odd sponsors. Like we have obligations that we have to fulfill as well. It, and, and there's repercussions if we don't. So, um, you know, so the plan is to get up there, try to get one down with a gun. And our best odds is always dad's place, you know, over the lease. And so I found out pH died, you know, it's just like, all right, let's go the, the dad's place. We got a good shot. We got, you know, we got a, uh, North, um, I think we, we had a North Northwest or something like that. And so I went to historically one of his best spots. I've killed several bucks out of this stand. We call it bud South. It's looking over a big biologic field. Um, and, and deer come out from anywhere. I mean, in any given night, you know, when the conditions are right, we might see 40 deer in the field. It's a, you know, you could see a long way. So that's part of it. You know, it's not that you have a shot at 40 deer. It's that you could, you know, you could see a long way. You could see behind you in a field behind you. So we're sitting there. Um, you know, we see a bunch of deer come out. It's the conditions are right. The pressure's good. Uh, but we don't see really any bucks. And then towards the end of the night, on the north end of the field, we have another box blind. I see a shooter. It's it's probably 400 yards away, so I really can't tell exactly why. He was a 10 pointer. I felt like he had good good mass, and we you know we got footage of him, but it's just real distance. So my camera guy had to go home. He could only come up and hunt that or film me one night or whatever. So he had to go home after our hunt. Dad ended up didn't see anything, and so I. For whatever reason, in the back of my mind, before I left my house, I was like, you know what? I'm going to pack my PSE just in case we don't get it done. Or even if we did get it done with a rifle, I'm there. I'm only going to come home Wednesday you know, after the morning. So, hey, might as well bring it. Well, it yeah. turns out the conditions are good. Uh, it was like 22 degrees, uh, like the heaviest frost of the year. And, I mean – like zero wind and super high pressure, probably like 30.4. And so I was like, you know what? Latest MRI I have, that buck, you know, nothing spooked in the field. That buck was right underneath the other box blind, um, you know, 400 yards away. Let's go back into that spot. The way that the train goes, the field kind of ends back there where that box blind is, and it's real tight quarters. And I've, I've killed a real nice deer back there uh, during gun season two years ago. And everything, almost everything there, if they're near the timber, is within bow range. And there's a couple huge hub scrapes. Dad's got a reconnaissance camera down there. And so it's historically, you know, if they come out, they're pretty much in bow range. And so I elected, because it was so cold, I was like, you know what, let's sit the box blind and try to stay as warm as we can. It was the coldest day of the year so far. And so we went into the spot. Dad had told me, he's like, look, the, the movement, especially with the temperature, you know, everything, you know, the heavy frost, they're probably not going to move until 815 to 845, somewhere in there at that specific spot. And, you know, he's got 12 years of history, you know, on the farm. So he, he yeah. pretty much knows what kind of movement he's going to have and where. He doesn't know what's going to come out. He just generally knows times. And uh, so we're sitting there. We got in there super early that morning um, because it's kind of you basically have to walk through the entire field to get to the spot. And so I wanted to get there really early before anything was up on their feet. And I thought with the heavy frost they were going to move late anyways. But we got in, got settled. About 8.15, deer start popping out. A nice young buck came out, started kind of nudging does. You know, young, probably three-year-old came right underneath us. And everything kind of fed off of the biologic. And then about 8.40, 8.45, I'm looking in front of us, and I say, Sh- you know, buck, buck, shooter. And instantly I knew, you know, he was a old deer, um, you know, I, f- at least five years old, that you could just tell the body on him was old and the face. And kind of the eyes were real squinty, had a real, like, gray, kind of a gray, white face to him. And so – he pops out at 85 yards, kind of straight in front of us to the west, so to the left. He crosses over and hits this hub scrape at 65. You know, and I – so we're in a box blind, and so I got to open the window. And the tough part about this spot is you got to figure out which window to open because either he's going to come 
down the timber on your on the west or or the east. You know, you don't know which side, but you better pick before he gets close because right, right. you're not going to open it. You're kind of on top of him. You're not going <laughs> to open it when he gets to you. So he hits. He goes to the right. He hits that that scrape and I open the front window but at that point he's kind of indicating he's going to come down my right side the east side and so I start unlatching the, the right window and if you've never hunted in a box blind I know it seems like it's you know shooting fish out of a barrel but it it's no I don't care what the box blind is it's just tough to get the windows open and get situated and get a shot and especially yeah. with a bow it's it's it can be challenging and we've done it enough I know that you know, the first thing we do when we get into a box blind, we open all the windows and kind of work them so that when you open it, if a deer comes out, it doesn't pop. Because if it's the first time you open it, that yeah. window is going to pop loud. That's and good point. so there's no wind. And so I had already worked the window. So I, I didn't, I wasn't worried about that. And so I went to unlatch the, the window to my right thinking he was going to go up that, that timber edge because we got another huge scrape over this camera kind of 35 yards right to the side of us and right at the last minute he decides to turn and head back across the field and at, so our front window is it, it's good this is the window that needs to be open but he's quartering two the whole way and at some point he kind of gets an idea that something's not right he stops and he looks right at us I mean he's staring right at us for the longest time and I had you know I'm holding I'm holding on him with my range finder and I range him there. He's at like 45 yards and you know, granted I hadn't shot a deer with my bow in three years, a period. It's not, yeah. I've hunted a lot, but I just haven't had the opportunities. The last year I had an opportunity at three years ago, I missed um, at the lease. And so I didn't, I knew that I wanted a deer to get a little bit closer before, you know, I might practice at those ranges, but I just wasn't going to take that shot. I haven't shot enough. And especially after during gun season, I hadn't shot in three weeks and I've been having hand issues. I got a uh, decorvain syndrome. It's a, a tendon issue in my right hand, which is where my release aids on. And it's just real painful to, to draw back. And so Jeez. I just, I felt confident enough in my shooting ability that if he's in 30 35 and in i feel like no brainer and I, I mean i shoot a lot i just haven't shot a lot recently so it's one of those things where you kind of go back to your hand eye coordination kind of the you know you, you know when you're shooting in the summer and practicing you got a certain set of things that you're doing kind of in order and i i just felt like it's muscle memory does mm -hmm. that make sense at that point? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So he's staring at us at 45. He finally breaks and comes to our west side, to the left, and uh, he gets to 35. That's the last time I range him. He's kind of, you know, got his rack up in the, the tree limbs and messing around there, and he's still quartering two, so I'm not taking the shot. And then he steps a few yards closer. So at this point, I, I'm holding my second pin, my 30 pin on him, and he's messing with those – more branches kind of you know licking branch scrape type deal and he turns broadside and this is really my last good opportunity before he'd get too far to our left where we would have had to open another window which would have been he'd have been like 15 yards underneath us it wouldn't have it would have been very tough so just by the grace of god pure luck whatever he turns broadside and camera guy says i'm on him I make the shot, and I'm shooting a Rage 2.0 chisel tip. You know, Mark and Terry like those Rage Extremes, that 2.3 cutting diameter. It's that, you know, big um, uh, cutting diameter that they love so much. But my setup, I'm 62 pounds. My draw length is like 28 and a half. It's just it's short, and I feel like I don't get a lot of – I don't care what bow I'm shooting. I just don't feel like I get a lot of um, – uh, feet per second you know I'm in that like 290 286 290 range and so Mark advised me to go down to the 2.0 last year and he felt like the chisel tip dad's a big believer in the chisel tip so I I tucked it tight I tr I don't know why I always do even I know I shouldn't but I always tuck it tight into that 
kind of knuckle there and yeah. I hit shoulder, but it busted through and, and got top of the heart, a little bit of lung. He ran 60 yards down the hill and, and died within seconds. So it was, um, it was oh, very man. intense and a lot of emotion came out <laughs> at that point. I can promise you, cause it was a long time coming. Well, I bet that's awesome, man. That's, yeah. uh, that feeling, especially when it's been a long time coming, I, I know that feeling and I'm happy for it. I'm glad you got that. I imagine there's a little monkey off your back with that kill, right? <laughs> it felt like it. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing I've, I've shot several deer in the last three years, but it's been with a gun and it's not for lack of trying with a bow. I just haven't had a deer that I wanted to shoot in front of me. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, I just was kind of snake bitten and, yeah. It just shooting one with a gun. I always have enjoyed it. I've always had a lot more success with a gun in hand. You reach out and touch them, but my adrenaline and my reactions are never the same. You know, I just have, I just, I'm just more excited. You, it's just so much more intense and there's yeah. so much time and effort. Like, I don't feel like I would have to be on the gun range very, very long to be able to go out and shoot one with a gun, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and practice to get one within bow range and make a good shot and so it felt it did feel good for sure yeah i'm i'm jealous of you man i want that feeling <laughs> it's been too you. long for me too um it's funny though it seems like lots of times like when you break the dam kind of like that all of a sudden then there's just a flood because <laughs> like you had the snowball effect right because we yeah. talked then last week we did our podcast with terry and you guys were talking about heading out to your Illinois property to do some hunting. Yeah. And uh, the good times kept rolling, didn't they? They did. So <laughs> we did that podcast. And I think it was the next night. I'm trying to remember. What day did we I do think, the podcast? No, it was, it was that night. That night. It was that night, Matt. Yeah. So we did the podcast that morning. That right. afternoon. So so the backstory of this lease, Dad had, um, you know, a 160-acre piece. And I think it was, it's a 500-acre piece that he leased last year. And he kept those two pieces because they were they were really good performing pieces. The 160s where I killed my buck last year during the the Illinois firearm season, and so those were kind of set up that for for archery. We didn't really have them set up for gun, but they were set up for archery. Well, at like the beginning of October, he got word from some of the farm manager, the farm manager that, that kind of takes care of some of the properties that we were hunting, that another piece of property that this owner owned was the, the other um, guy that was leasing it decided to drop it right there in October. And it was a thousand acres. So it's a huge piece. And like, I know that's, it's, it's probably not um, applicable for your average guy to pick up a thousand acres last minute like that but we were in the position that we could we had just sold his 60 acre piece uh over in illinois by tomies um this past summer so we felt like yeah we could we could pick up this lease for this year and see what it's about and the problem is he was hunting so hard there in October trying to kill one in Missouri with his bow and then un unfortunately had a camera guy that um decided to quit November 1st and so, so we were scrambling to pick up a new camera guy for him and then November 10th he had his accident you know and so basically the end of the the, the result was he never got over there to set this thousand acres up so um you know, we were really behind the eight ball and it kind of goes back to the beginning of my story when I was saying like he felt a lot of internal pressure to get back out and hunt, even though like he's got five broken ribs, a b broken vertebrae, a broken ankle, bruised lungs. He had a concussion like the dude doesn't stop. He's a machine. He's an animal like <laughs> in my 36 years of living with him. I have never seen him take a break. <laughs> it's just it's wow. it's it's exhausting to watch, frankly, <laughs> but that's just how he is. That's that's why he's successful. And so he felt a lot of pressure, in my opinion, to, to get out there, even though he wasn't feeling good inside, he felt the pressure because we spent the money on the lease. Um, we weren't killing anything to, to help with the show. We we're putting a lot of pressure for Mark and, and Taylor and Wade. And finally my archery deer, like he was more excited and happy than I was. Cause I think he felt like, thank you. We, we finally are contributing monkeys off <laughs> both of our backs. It was kind of a a good thing for the both of us like it's yeah. they're a team we're b team we get it <laughs> you know your role right but we still got to contribute yeah. and so 
it felt good to get one, you know, to get one down. And uh, so we go into Illinois, and that's a four-day season, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, like the 30th through the 3rd, I think, November to December. So we hunt Thursday, don't have any luck. I get to the spot. Thursday night, I hunted where I killed last year. I get there, and the farmer had turned the dirt like it was beans. They had beans there. Obviously, they harvested the beans. Dad did not know the farmer at the time. He did not know that farmer, so we couldn't like purchase a, a standing you know crop an acre or two. And so we get there, not knowing what it looked like, and I, I stepped foot on it, and all the dirt was turned. Like there wasn't Oof. even any. You know, I understand that they could have been cut, but there was nothing there. And so, you know, it, it, we kind of felt like, all right, this is going to be a waste of a night, but let's sit sit here and see what the MRI is. Saw 13 does, a lot more than I expected. They had their heads down in this dirt eating. I don't know what they were eating. And so Friday rolls around, and we did our podcast with you that morning. We didn't hunt Friday morning. We, we went out and, and classed fields and kind of got some MRI. And Friday mid-morning, we did the podcast with you. Friday at 1230, Dad and I had a meeting with this farmer. Um, and and he – so the farmer of the 160, he's also the farmer of the 1,000 acres. So it was good. We finally got to meet him. We wanted to go over a game plan for 2018 of where we wanted to buy some standing crops. Hey, if we could plant some food plots in this area and that area. Like we had no green – over there at all this year and in illinois you can kind of get away with that if you have grain those deer it's just it's just a different kind of beast over there like if you have corn or beans in a decent amount like you're still going to have some luck even without green but our theory has always been you know tuck some green food source into those you know edges into those fingers so to speak of so if you got corn going back to the to to the finger of a timber you know you want to have a little bit of biologic an acre or two of biologic tucked in the very back of that thing and it's just uh you're feeding them forward it's a green to grain grain to green type of a theory in hunting and so we were going over that plan and as we were doing that our two camera guys which are long time you know, jury guys, Tim Sigler, Aaron Bennett, Aaron's a whitetail properties agent. Now he's, they both worked for Mark and Terry back in the day on as farm managers. And then they still film for us a lot. And then they hunt as well. So they came up for the hunt and these guys are good hunters in their own right. And so we went over the aerial, we kind of decided, look, this 500 acres to the, I think it was to the East the neighbors are hunting hard and they got it's gun season and they got like eight or nine guys in there hunting this 500 acres. Let's oh. use that against them, you know, to in our favor, I should say, and pull off of the edge as far as we can, knowing that they're probably pushing in the way the wind was blowing. They're probably pushing deer out of their place just by the intrusion and into our farm. We don't have anything set up. But let's pop up a ground blind. I brought a muddy uh, redemption ground blind with me, knowing that we may need to do something like this. And so we kind of gave them the general area we wanted to set the ground blind up. And as we were meeting with the farmer, they went out and set up the ground blind. And so they looked at, you know, once they got over there, they were looking at sign to find the exact spot. So by 1 o'clock, they had this ground blind set up. By 3.30, Aaron and I are back into it, and we're hunting you know, three, three forty-five, three probably about four o'clock. Deer starting to come out, 30, 40, 50, 60 yards. Does are popping out right in front of us. So they're kind of looking at that blind. They're not sure, but we brushed it in the best we could, or they did, and um, they accepted it. One doe, you know how there's always one. She really <laughs> the lead doe. She wasn't really having it. She kept uh-huh. looking, 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 but they kept feeding forward. All of a sudden, they look back outsteps the deer that you know and we had no recon i had no mri whatsoever of the deer herd itself to know what was even in there so outsteps a buck you know aaron because the way we were positioned i couldn't see down in that corner and it was kind of below until to the left and aaron's like shooter 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 and so i get the gun like i don't even look down there because the does are look you know i trust aaron and the does are looking at us so i'm just worried about getting the gun out without getting busted 
So slowly get the gun on my trigger stick, get it out. I'm shooting a, I had a muzzleloader only tag, so I'm shooting a traditions 50 cal muzz. Um, so I'm getting the gun out and finally I get it positioned. And the first time I ever see the deer is when I got him in the scope and he's probably 65 yards and there's a little bit of weeds and, and grass kind of, cause we're sitting pretty low compared to the terrain, like the way the field then comes up it, and we're sitting on cut beans, like, but there's remnants of beans there left, you know, and that that's kind of what those does were eating and the hill just, it just kind of humps that field. So we're sitting down pretty low and there's just a little bit too much grass to our left. And I was, you know, I was planning on waiting until he stepped out further, but these does they're at this point, like 20 yards in front of us in their eye level and they're getting really goosey. And so even though I'm not looking at them, I could kind of out of the corner of my eye, see the, you know, the head bob. And uh-huh. so <laughs> he starts getting goosey at this point, you know, Aaron's like, if you're going to shoot him, you better shoot him. And I had him fine, you know, in the scope, he was close. Uh, and, and, you know, I took the shot and, um, he drops. I, I had to follow up with another shot. I had to get out of the blind and follow up with another shot. I, w- one mistake I did make, and this is probably a learning moment for anybody, in the heat of the moment, I held on dead on where I would always hold on, you know, but the gun is side end zeroed at a hundred. So at 65, I hit high a couple inches too high it dropped him, but I I did have to follow up. I got out of the blind. I reloaded, got out of the blind and followed up with another shot. But, uh, which that's always kind of an intense moment. If that's ever happened to you, it's a pretty, you know, you're wanting to do the right thing and, 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 and let the animal expire and all that. And, and so you know, got back to the blind, excited. Dad was really excited. It felt good to get, you know, get one down in Illinois for, you know, kind of all the ground we had over there. It felt really good to, to really not have it set up and pop up a blind and just kind of go off of instinct and using what, you know, we saw was the sign there at the property and using kind of the neighbor's intrusion, kind of all into this plan, pop up a blind and within three hours, boom you know, deer down. So, and I, yeah. I honestly, I think he's like six or seven. I mean, he was Ugh. old, old, old. So it felt that good. That's awesome. Yeah. Felt good. Well, congrats, Matt. You, uh, you have had a nice couple weeks here and, <laughs> and now not only are you carrying the load now on uh, the 13 side, but you're carrying the load for the 100% wild podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> Team B is bringing the heat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I still haven't killed anything worth talking about. So, but I think the point is, it goes to show you it can turn for you at any time, right? Yeah. And you can even those odds. And I, you know, I would have never thought we could have got got it done with a bow the day after gun season. But it can it can happen. You just kind of stick to your instincts and use the MRI you got and keep grinding. You know, and it, it doesn't always work out. It hadn't worked out for me in years past, but it, it fell together this year. And and then. You know, dad followed up the next night with, I think, his biggest Illinois deer ever, and I think his best buck in general in several years. I mean, a top, top five, ten deer for him ever. So it was pretty, pretty unreal, honestly. That's that's so cool. I was so happy to see Tara get that killed, too, especially coming back off the injury and everything. And real quick, we we do need to get to our question here pretty quick, but, uh, how did he handle shooting that gun? Because we talked last week about how he wasn't sure how that was going to feel. Yeah. How did that go over for him? Yeah, well, I think it hurt worse than he thought. So we oh. thought it was going to. So he hadn't shot. We had his guns sighted in for him. We made a, a, a change in sponsorship this year uh, to Leopold on the scope. So we had to re in all of our guns. And that's – that's um, that's a lot of work for anybody that's never done that. That's a lot of work. And so we had his gun sighted in. Um, his, he was shooting a Winchester SX3 20 gauge. And so we had it sighted in. He felt good about us having it sighted in for him. But there's always a little bit of – he's a lefty, and all the guys sighting his guns in are righty. So there is a little bit of difference there in how you hold and, and kind of the way that, that the trajectory goes. You know, so – you know, we weren't going to have him shoot leading in because I just felt like he felt like he wouldn't be able to handle it shooting too much. So yeah. they're sitting there and it's about 4:15. And I think one thing we can't overlook 
uh, this weekend was that, and we said it in the podcast the other day, the moon was rising very early in the evenings, Mm -hmm. getting to that super moon on Sunday. So the conditions were perfect for early movement in the, in the afternoons. And so he was sitting there, um, it was about 4.15, I think, or 4.30. Well, they had several does coming out, and he was sitting over. He had an acre of standing beans, and he was really tucked down into this timber. And he was sitting in a muddy bull blind. It was the one uh, bull blind that he had set up and ready. And so he was sitting kind of his what he felt like was his best spot. And uh, sure enough, that do- does started coming out. And they were feeding, and the way the terrain went, they were kind of looking straight into that box blind. And um, this buck pops out. And Timmy's like, you know, and Dad, Dad's dad been doing this a long time, granted. So, like, he's 150-inch deer. Like, for me, I wouldn't hesitate. For him, he's got to make sure it's age or, you know, there's a lot of other factors there. And, um, so Timmy's like, Hey, Terry, I think you should get your binoculars up. I think it's a good deer. So dad finally looked, cause this rack, you know, dad could see from far away that he was tight racked. He was tall, but tight. He was, he only ended up scoring 14 inches as far as width of the rack. And so anyway, so dad finally decides, all right, you know, let, let's take a look. And he's like, Holy cow. He's, you know, great deer mass character, time length. You know, he looks old. You know, th- that was kind of the debate. It was like, is he three or is he four? And finally, after really looking at him, they felt like he was either a rundown four-year-old or a rundown five-year-old at this point in the season. And so he's going to shoot him, but he had to wait like 15, 20 minutes because these does, I mean, he couldn't get his window open. He just couldn't get the window open with the way Ugh. the does were. And so he finally gets the gun out, has a good broadside shot, takes a shot, drops the deer, and I think um, – at the moment, it didn't hurt necessarily, but, you know, by the time he called me and, and I stuck around just to make sure if they needed help getting one out, and he's like, we're going to need you to come over here. He's like, I can't, you know, he was, he was, it was painful to watch him, honestly. Like, we had mm-hmm. to get his, his cane back out, and, you know, he, he's hobbling around pretty bad, and I think, you know, he, after that, he was in bad, bad shape, so I don't know what the rest of his season's going to look like, honestly, but he's um, he's hurting pretty bad right now. So, yeah. you know, but <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> and it was a good <laughs> it was a good deer to be hurting for for sure. Yeah, it looked like it looked like a really nice buck. So, hopefully, uh, hopefully he feels better soon. And I'm sure looking at that buck on the wall for future years will uh, will make it all seem worthwhile. I'd, I'd guess at least it's going to be a memory that he'll not forget. I could promise yeah. you that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. So uh, I think we should probably get to that question of the day before we have to wrap things up here because we do have a good question that I think we can offer a few thoughts on before we shut this uh, show down. So what do you think, Matt? Let's do it. The question of the day is brought to you by Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter. My name is Brent Lay from Chelsea, Michigan. My question is, what is your guys' opinion about shooting cold deer? I have a thousand acre piece of property we hunt down in Ohio. We have a 130 inch minimum on that property. But for the last few years, the landowner has decided that he would like spike horns and three pointers and such as what he would call scrub bucks taken out. What we've noticed over the last couple years anyway is that it doesn't seem like we have as many trophies running around. So we just like your opinion. Matt, do you want first take at this or you want me to give my two cents? I'll do short and sweet and let you go from there. Basically, if it's a young deer and it's a spike, you never know what it's going to turn into. I've seen a post from, I think, QDMA or something that's been on social media where it shows like the progression of a spike. You know, you just you just never know. So like I, if it's, you know, three year old buck and he's a spike, I'd say, yeah. But if, if he's, you know, if he's a yearling or a year and a half, two years old, like I wouldn't, I don't know. And, and I'm the king of shooting coal bucks. Like <laughs> dad calls it the Matt jury buck. You know, that's, that's kind of my MO. I get it. I'm good with it. But those are deer that are like four or five years old before we decide he's a cold buck. Um, even a three pointer. I, I just depends on the age and, and he didn't say that part, but I mean, I would have a hard time believing that if they're shooting spikes that are yearlings or whatever, 
uh, that that doesn't affect the overall herd down the road. That's just my opinion of it. I, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're spot on. There's been a lot of uh, literature put out on this by organizations like Quality Deer Management Association and other research institutes and things. And the, the long and short of it is that hunters in a free range situation cannot make a difference when it comes to genetics in a free ranging herd. It simply is impossible to do, um, you know, selective breeding within a captive facility. Definitely. You can selectively breed these deer and change the genetics of a herd. Um, but it's just, it's not possible within a wild free range hunting scenario. So, um, killing these spikes or three pointers, these young bucks that, um, you think may be genetic, genetically inferior you're not improving your genetic pool at all um you're actually just killing young bucks and then eliminating the potential for those bucks to mature and, and just like you said matt there's so many examples of of spikes or small three pointers or four pointers blowing up over the course of their of their their lives and still becoming really big mature bucks so you know these deer just need the age they need the opportunity to express you know whatever genetic potential they might have um so so yeah this type of thing calling for genetics just doesn't work now you could make an argument for say you know if you have a property um let's just say you've got 300 acres or something like that and um you want to have the the best size possible bucks if that's something you're you're managing for you want to see some bigger antler deer um you might want – there's something to be said about you know having a buck like a Matt Drury buck that maybe it's an eight-pointer that's never going to get really, really big. But he's reached maturity already. You see he's never going to get much bigger. Um, I think it makes sense then. You could kill that buck to make sure that there's less competition for that three-year-old or four-year-old buck that does have the potential to become really big. Um you know, by, by removing competition for nutrition, by removing competition for bedding areas and things like that, um, that makes some sense. But that's only, you know, killing those bucks that you've seen have reached whatever potential they're going to get to. Um, killing something at one and a half just is not going to help. Um, you know, for, for a couple things, lots of times those year and a half old bucks are dispersing too. So you have this yearling buck dispersal that happens in the fall. So lots of times, even if you're killing those bucks, um, you know, they are moving off beforehand. They're from a different place. You've got this whole genetic dispersal thing going on too. So there, there's so many different factors going on, not to mention the fact that does contribute a lot of the genetics to making a buck big antlered or not too. Um, and if you're not selecting for that, which obviously you can't, since you can't see the antler genes in a, in a doe, um, there's no way to control for that as well. So, so long story short, all that rambling is to say that um, your landowner's idea about killing spikes and quote unquote scrub bucks at year and a half old um, is not going to help your situation if you're looking to have a better deer herd or bigger antler deer. Um, things that might improve it actually would be letting more deer reach maturity, trying to improve the available nutrition, um, trying to get a more balanced herd structure. So if you have a more balanced buck to doe ratio, more balanced age structure of year two, three, four, five year old bucks. Those types of things lead to a healthy herd. Um, they lead to fawns being dropped at the right time during the year so they can um, be as healthy as possible. Those types of things can lead to a healthier population, bigger, more mature deer, bigger antler deer. Um, those are the types of things I'd recommend looking into or suggesting to them rather than shooting those year and a half olds because that forky that you shot, you know, he could be a booner five years from now if you gave him the chance and if he had the right nutrition and maybe he wouldn't be, but there's that kind of chance too. So, um, I think that's, that's what everything I've read shown. That's all the different biologists I've talked to. That's what they've said. So, uh, so I tend to trust them on that and, uh, I'm letting those little dinkers, I'm letting them walk right now. I'm going to wait and see what they turn into. So. Yeah, I mean, even that mentality, there's always been once a spike, always a spike, or once an eight-pointer, always an eight-pointer. It's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. I've, PH was an eight-pointer for the longest time, and he, he ended up growing that additional time and became a 10-pointer two years ago. You know, it's 160 class year. So you just you just never know. I mean, you, you got to let the age get there before you could really judge, okay, you know, I've had several years of 
pictures and this deer is not getting any better. All right, he needs to go, you know? Yeah. And it's strange. A lot of times it seems like sometimes those are dominant deer too. Yeah. Like the, you know, the Matt Drury bucks there that they need to go because they're preventing a really good deer from getting, getting in, you know, to your area, or your spot you're hunting. So uh, it's tough to do. I'll say that because a lot of times you just, you know, you might be um, holding out for a bigger deer but they're, you know, sometimes the right thing to do is to shoot the coal buck and it's tough, but, and you know, Mark is a good case in point, you know, Wade, you know, he shoots a lot of the coal, coal bucks. He's got kind of a hit list and Mark's got a hit list. And, you know, so they're still managing Mark's property the right way. Um, but Mark's got a guy that he really trusts and he's a good, you know, good hunter. And heck, even at this point, some of Wade's coals are, are starting to be trophy animals, you know? So, oh, heck yeah. you know, Mark's a perfect example of, of a property being managed kind of that way. And obviously good genetics are a big part of that, but, um, you know, they've, they've managed it to kind of get to where it is. So it can sure. be done, but shooting think, young bucks probably isn't the way to go. Exactly. I think the point, like the, the right thing that Mark's doing there is that his quote unquote call bucks, they are mature deer. Yeah. So it's not like he's not calling something before it can express his potential. He's, he's quote unquote calling something that, Hey, this is a mature deer. He's maybe a bully buck that's keeping other deer around yeah. or, he, you know, he's taking up space, he's taking up nutrition. He's doing these things and, um, you know, it's a good mature buck to harvest and then opens up opportunity for other deer that might have more potential in, in the antler category if that's what they're going for. So, yeah, I, uh, I'd love to be in Wade's shoes and shoot some of those bucks. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so he works his butt off though. If there's ever a guy that deserves it, he does. And to be with Mark every day for four months, it's <laughs> it's intense <laughs> I, bet. I bet well uh i'm gonna do my very best to kill a bully buck here in michigan because i i'm still after holyfield and i think he's he's an example of that kind of deer he's just a big eight pointer um that has looked pretty much the same for the last three years um and i've been wondering and there's like no other mature bucks that have shown up in the last three years it's him and only him um, for three years now, and I've I've wondered like, is he a bully buck? Like he's just he's just like staked his claim, and nothing else is coming in here. Like there's not even a random rut buck showing up. Wow. It's just him. Um, it's just so. Yeah, so I wonder if if I kill him or if someone kills him. I'm curious to see what's going to happen. How that kind of what the vacuum effect is going to be. Who's going to show up to uh, take his place? So uh, I'm going to do my best to be the reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your strategy now that you know? Because you kind of got to switch gears at this point in the season. What strategy moving forward? Yeah. So um, assuming he's still alive, which. Um, I have some tentative reason to believe that. I'm not going to say one way or the other for sure, but I think he made it. Um, so assuming that's the case, I'm just going to be conservative um, but aggressive when the right conditions are present. So uh, you know, I've shifted to that late season uh, strategy now where I've got a couple good late season food sources on this property that historically he's been really active on in December. Um, over the past two years, I have more daylight activity from him during December than any time of the year on these food sources. So I know that if I just hunt smart with the right wind, when I get things like a cold front hitting or snow um, or good barometric pressure, something like that, um, those days when I have the conditions, I'm going to go in there, hunt those best spots, um, and then I'm not going to push it at all on those days when it's not happening. And then the, the one other thing I can do is, as we've talked about in the past, there's a I can see from the front of the property up on a hill, I can observe some of these spots. So I'll probably spend some nights not hunting, but sitting on that hill and just observing down there and trying to get eyes on them. And, um, and if I see him coming out, then I'll know, okay, now it's time to strike too. So that's the game plan. Here's the question though, Mark, if he comes out and it's during your gun seat, your muzzleloader season, are you taking the shot this year? Mm. Yes, I've thought about that long and hard, and I've decided um, I'm 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 no purist. I'm a hunter, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm gonna hunt with whatever I can hunt with, and whatever's legal to kill this buck, uh, I will use that. So uh, I'm gonna go out there with a muzzleloader and uh, get it done if I can, and if I can't get it done with muzzleloader, I'll be back out there with a bow after, and uh, 
just going to keep at it with whatever tools I have uh, at my disposal. I hope you get him, man. Because if, if you're our last hope to get this <laughs> hook, I don't know. I mean, he's. I think he's dead. Uh, PH, I know, is dead. Like, we're not succeeding in Missouri, so Michigan, <laughs> you're our last hope here. Well, I got got my fingers crossed, and we got a big cold front hitting uh, tomorrow. Kind of started hitting today, but it's really, really, really windy right now. But tomorrow... It's going to be like 20 degrees cooler than it was beforehand yesterday, and the winds are going to start dying down Wednesday night into Thursday and Friday. So that three-day period, I think, could be pretty good. Um, so that'll be my first, uh, barring some kind of change in the conditions, that's going to be my first late-season strike at him. Good. So. Well, that's actually coincides with our phase on 13. We call waiting on a front, the date range. And that's so true of this time of year. If that front, big front like that comes through, if, especially if you have a grain – type of a food source beans yep. or corn or man it can be absolutely deadly because they'll go put a feed bag on man for sure yep. that's that's what i'm hoping is gonna be the case and i got a spot i can sit where i've got a brassica food plot that's you know within 60 70 yards of this blind and then i've got a cut cornfield that would be about 100 yards out um so i could i could you know be looking over a couple different types of food sources um and i'm tight to his bedding area so that's if it's going to happen, I'm guessing it's going to be there. Um, it's just going to be a matter of is, is it going to come, come out within range within that green food source or the, the southern end of that cornfield? Or is he going to come out too far north and out of range? Um, it's hard to say with him. He, he's usually just out of range, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm extending that range now with the muzzleloader. So, so is, do you have a mu- is it muzzleloader season right now? Yeah. Oh, yep. awesome. It, it just opened up. So um, conditions it'll be, are right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple weeks to get it done with the muzzy, and uh, I just was shooting it yesterday just to make sure again that everything's looking good, and I've got dialed in and ready to rock and roll. So, good. hopefully next time I'll have good news. I look forward to it. I hope you do, buddy. I hope the next next podcast is all about Mark Kenyon. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> for for the sake of our listeners, I think I think everyone from the Wire Done podcast, the Hundred Percent Wild podcast, they are sick of hearing about this deer. So. <laughs> Um, for I think everybody sake, can relate, for, though. You always got that one that kind of gets in your crawl, and most of us aren't Mark Drury, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it doesn't always end with a guy behind, you know, sitting on the ground with a tag on him. So no. it's relatable. That's for sure. That's for sure. Well, I think we better wrap this one up, Matt. So um, our real quick reminders for our listeners and viewers, uh, from my end at least, would be just to make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. And then um, you can submit a question of your own by going to wiredtohunt.com slash 100% wild. And uh, if you want to follow along with my hunts over the coming week for Holyfield, um, I'll be posting frequent Instagram stories, um, you know, little videos and pictures and updates throughout the day of all those hunts. Um, so you can find that at the Wired to Hunt Instagram account. Um, and that's all I got. As always, you can follow along and watch this podcast and all the others on the Drury Outdoors YouTube channel. While you're there, please subscribe to the channel. We're giving away um, a free PSE bow. We just gave one away for hitting 50,000 subscribers. We're trying to reach 100,000, uh, so we'll have another giveaway or two along the way. Uh, we got a ton of great content. Natural Barn uh, is brand, is brand new, never been aired anywhere before. It's airing on our out on our YouTube channel first, and then we'll be over on our Pursuit channel. Uh, and as always, you can follow us at Jury Outdoors on all the social media: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and JuryOutdoors.com. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for watching and listening. All right. Peace.